is overwhelming. So this is terrible. The Ministry of Education does not see safety as a priority. In fact, and I can rest my head on a block on this, they will wait for something very serious to happen before they can do something. Case in point, I recently visited the school, whilst I was at Cipriani here, visited the school with the day of the school in Port of Spain, a convent. I won't call you here. No, that's good. Yeah. Right? Visited the school. <clears throat> they have parapet walls that have been structurally cracked right from. And I don't even have to see, and take a look on the outside, you'll see the same thing. Parapet walls have been there. If we get a shape, five or six on the other scale, those walls are coming down. That's instant death for anyone that's on there. What they're doing? Absolutely nothing. It's reached to the point where it's about mud or only on money. Nothing else. And it's sad that everything has to always boil down when it comes to safety about money. <coughs> And um, that is something you can't get away from. True. So that is why and I tell people who practice safety as a profession, we have to be dynamic in how we sell safety. We have to let the employers recognize safety means production, increasing production, more money. That is what drives it. You know, our job is for them to understand that um, that same concept that Safety is a burden, it's a cash burden, no. It is something, as long as your company deals with it properly and effectively, it has the effect of making a very productive company. There's something also I wanted to add that I saw whilst I was doing a research for one of our projects that we handle that. And I saw an article on the web page that safety should not be used as a bargaining chip. And basically the article is alluding to the fact that trade unions are utilizing safety as a means of dropping tools, walking off the compound, and, and it was all about the fact that they didn't get paid or they didn't get the right paid. And that is so, it's, it's that, and it's also telling <coughs> that they are now using it as an excuse. <coughs> so that has to, that concept now has to change because the administrators, the employers are now thinking that if a worker, an employee, decides to make a complaint due to unsafe condition or unsafe act that is being taken place on the compound, they probably want money. Go take them on. So if, if, if I guess, you do not hire, right? No. Hush. Hush? No. <laughs> I like how you kind of dovetail the two. So one of them is a higher student. Of the union, yes. Yes. Right, so, so let me make that guess. When I was a student in these wards some years ago, and um, sat over safety and went down the way of higher, so I dovetail the two. Um, but that's why you're here. And we hope that after you spend you know, your time here at Supriani, you know, it's all about going out there and making a positive change. And, you know, that's what we want everybody to to be part of the solution. So we can forward for the unions to come together with management and fix the problem for the unions. You know, don't, don't, don't expect the agency to fix it all. Of course not. Yes, right, Edson, talk to me. I've been here since 2017, mm. January. I came on the 16th of January to the exam. And that's when I say I came and made sick money. That was the first time um, being in an in a institution at this level, tertiary mm. level institution. I came here as a novice. I knew nothing about safety other than the date. But I reckon it's about to start, so I'm going to leave it for after. Right, so beautiful for the panel. So, hang on to Mr. Tony Archibald. All right, um, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, let me take this opportunity to welcome you to this auspicious uh, event that we are having here um, a collaboration between the OSH Agency, OSHA, and Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. Um, at this point, let me introduce to you the panel. Uh, we have Mr. Lawrence Solomon, senior person here at the college. Uh, Mr. Franz Bis Brisbane, the senior inspector at OSHA. And Mr. Victor Salazar, 
OSHA, OSHA Inspector Toot. Um, today we are commemorating the World Day for Safety and Health. And um, another today, also on Thursday, we'll be continuing this discussion that we will be having. Um, the theme that we are looking at is the birth and evolution <coughs> of occupational safety and health in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, ILO celebrates um, World Day for Safety and Health on the 28th of April each year. So that meaning Sunday past was the celebration of Health and Safety Day the world over. So um, at this point in time, well, let me give you the team for health and safety globally from ILO. It is occupational safety and health and the future of work. So without no further ado, let me hand you over to the panel at this time. Well, yeah, um, introduction to me, right? So formerly, formerly, my um, name is Victor Salazar, Arch Inspector attached to the Occupational Safety and Agency. And thank you very much for coming out. We're going to go into it right away. So, I'll join you to use the team. So, your presentation outlined. So, it's two parts. Today, we're going to deal with the initial evolution of safety and health to be. How did it all begin? We spent some time talking about that. And on Thursday, we go right in to the, continue, the continued evolution. So we're going to take it from the birth, it has matured a bit, and we're going to take it from that evolution point, and how would that impact on safety and work in the future going forward? Because in everything, to go forward, you must know what was going on in the past. You must have an understanding of the history to know how the future will be impacted upon. So that's why we're going to take that approach and dissecting the topic today. You know, uh, the funny thing, as I told you earlier on, we went through the papers this week, <coughs> this weekend, and as Ronnie indicated, the 28th of April was the commemoration, commemoration of World Health and Safety Day. And it was nice to see the major players in this country actually celebrating the day with us. You know. And while we don't read the newspapers, in fact, it was the news day, Sunday news day, I saw an article of, it was really a speech given by the president for our country, the Honorable Paul Amy Weeks. And I couldn't help, you know, I couldn't help, but it's the first time I saw it, so it was something that really touched me. And I said, during the session today, I really had to start from that point, because to me, it is nice to see at the very top, we are managing safety. Because we know in organizations, with respect to safety and health, as long as management buying, safety would survive, <clears throat> the culture would change, and people's lives would be affected positively. If we cannot get employer buying, and that's a challenge we have as safety practitioners, we'll be fighting up in battle. So, going straight into a quote from the newspaper article, it says, um, part of it, the country in her view must make sure that the fundamental human rights to a safe and healthy work environment is respected at all levels and in all circumstances. Respected at all levels and in all circumstances. So we're talking from the very top all the way down to the bottom. From the CEOs who control the powers, you know, they are the movers and shakers, to the parliamentarians, to the select minded individuals, to the employees, you know, the ordinary guy who is a subcontractor or a permanent self minded, he may have his own contracting at the side, everybody, and in all circumstances, safety and health should touch those people's lives and be safe with places that cause me. And she fully extended it by saying, despite this, because she got to the heart of the ILO's team. There, there are new risks. Although said weeks, new technologies have revolutionized the workplace. 
They come with new threats to workers' privacy and security. Demographic trends such as women participation in the informal economy and increasing migration have highlighted the potential for exploitation and lack of occupational, safe, occupational health, safety and health oversight. So we can actually see some of this happening in Trinidad right now, we live in it. The whole issue of migration. We experience it right now. And the exploitation of those persons is not something that, you know, we must take for granted because people, the normal person in that situation, people take advantage of them. But as the president said in her speech, all sectors, all circumstances, all circumstances. So even those people, those migrant employees, from across from Venezuela, anywhere else they come from, they are expected to be the recipient of a standard of safety and health commensurate with the population of Trinidad and Tobago as citizens. That is what we're shooting for. As I say, aim for the stars. Ready the moon, no problem. Because when the challenges we are seeing out there from the agency's perspective, yes, there's abundance of migrant workers. But at the end of the day, employers have to understand in the OSHA where the duty of the employer is required, they are required to ensure that information and training is had by these persons. If there's a language barrier, you as an employer, you have to bridge that gap. Your signage and all those issues has to be addressed. It cannot be that you are hiring the workers and not looking at your seat. So this is also something I want to, um, it, it shows us how in the present day culture how robotics and automation are actually impacting on us. <laughs> So that is how the old is meeting in you. You know, and that is the challenge we are faced with, and you are realizing now that we are using robotics to treat and make safer workplaces. This is an example. This is an example. I found it was rather, it is something topical that, that happened not too long ago. And you see how the future, in terms of the robotics and the use of drones, was pivotal in the firemen actually fighting that fire to save the parts of the kitchen that we need to do. And for us as a nation, we must appreciate that it is something that even the young persons who are involved in engineering, because safety is something that is multidisciplinary, we want you all to keep looking in your mind to see how can I, in my own little area, be inventive. Don't feel inventions is only something that comes from the first world nations. There's a story that was exposed to as a youth. There was this bus stuck in a, a tunnel. They're trying to wreck it. Engineers, everybody there trying to get this bus out of the tunnel. It's stuck. The roof to the top of the, the tunnel can't move. A little child coming from school told them, I'm going to let the air out of the tunnels and wreck it. Let the air out of the tires. So we'll just drop and you're going to wreck it out of the tunnel. <coughs> and that is to show us at the end of the day, we could make an impact as long as we are willing and we see and we believe 
all those inventors, they didn't get it right the first time, like tell people. If you do your research, all the Einstein, all those other all those other guys, they would have failed countless times, more than we could imagine, before they struck gold. And those inventors have impacted on us. So, you know, I'm glad when I see young people as part of this forum today, where it tells us and tells me, because I wouldn't be around the next 50 years to see the changes, but I know there will be some changes. I expect you all to go out there and really have a positive impact in terms of change. Okay? So now we're going to go back into the whole history of the birth of occupational safety and legislation in Trinidad and Tobago. And I'm so sick of so not individually, you know, in terms of that. But um, pressing right along. So it's all about during the time of this country knowing itself. And becoming an independent nation, coming out of colonialism. You know, those struggles. You know, it's always telling if we do history and we research the development of safety, we realize it is something that is always impacted upon from some measure of struggle. It doesn't come easy. So during that, during that development, that um developmental time of the country, Veteran and Tobago was finding itself during the, of, the time of colonialism and independence. The struggle led by the trade union movement impacted positively in the whole trust in getting safety and health up and running. Now, the uprisings of 1930, yes, it was focused on a whole lot of, a whole host of issues, not only safety, but you get there by whichever means necessary at the end of the day in terms of what are the drivers of the day that created the discussion, the type of working environment, the type of employment environment, <coughs> be it segregation, be it any sort of separatist ideologies that existed then. It caused a few and cry among the population during that growing pain period between colonialism and independence. And born out of that, we found the first piece of legislation being the, what we call the, the factory ordinance of 1940. Now, the Moen Commission of 1938 and 1939, that was just a commission that really came down here, they came down here appointed by the Queen to hear the, the, the flight of the persons and see how best could we make it work. So within that struggle, as we said, one of the things that came out of, out of the many other things that came out, one thing that came out was we need to have some sort of safety in the legislation in the country. And coming up to that, well, we just adopted the factual ordinance of 1914. So that was the first legislation. Now one thing you must understand, that legislation at that time was a narrow set of um, occupations that covered and worked environments. Just remember that as you go ahead in the presentation, it covered a narrow set of occupations that, in terms of the definition back then was a factory. So a lot of workplaces that we know today weren't covered by this piece of legislation. And what is this I'm speaking about? Different kind of small, but it's really the factual ordinance of 19, number 44 of 1946. Okay? So, now we're going to go into the influence of economic development on anti statistics in the oil and gas sector and construction sector as an, as an example. So between the period 1974 to 1983, that's what we call the boom years in trying to do. Those of us who were around at that time, with the oil boom, money, plenty of money. And with, with the oil boom in tow, it impacted positively 
and trying to be able to finance, finance and financial considerations. <coughs> but the issue of safety and health in the oil and gas sector, and by extension construction, because in any, in any boom, construction is a driver in terms of employing people and getting people to work. Any government uses that to get people to work in the shortest possible time to remain a of the situation. But during that period, 1974-1983, we had 25 fatalities. Which, from a lot of the accidents, we had 1,537 non-fatal. So we had an explosion at the point, at the train point up here, on October the 15, 1985, where we had 14 workers who died and several others injured. Now, you're seeing this now for the first time. Max, a question. How much people knew that was the highest fatality for an accident in Trinidad to be? Absolutely. You ever asked yourself that question before now? What is the highest fatality accident in Trinidad to be in terms of safety? <clears throat> so we know now. And then we had the explosion at Camp Omega. That was a, a bunker storage of explosives and stuff. It was something that was controlled. The jurisdiction was under the police service, but it was located at the Army Barracks at Camp Omega. And that explosion, we had two soldiers who died and four firemen. Now, as I always said, the safety is always built on the backs and blood of employees. Only when these things happen, you know, there's a cue and a cry, and then gradually you're going to find a station, find this way in the corridors. And they are actually acted upon and become law to protect the employees as we go forward. And we see there, and I went to earlier in 1974. So, the Ordering Commission of 1972 was an impetus for that development. Do you all know in Trinidad and Tobago, we started developing our, I shall continue it now, consultation started way back in 1972-74. In 1974, the English have on their books and still on the books today, what we call the safety and health a group act of 1974. That's the English legislation. So the CDL called 1974. So that's two years after the Ordering Commission. But back then, we had already started the discussion in getting a decision in place to repeal the factory ordinance. Because we recognize it did not cover the white sector of, em of employees and workplaces. So it took 32 years, 32 years <coughs> before we reached the point that the Arsh Act, as you know it today, was, in, was law and came into place. 32 years. And from its inception to now, and as we were discussing earlier, do we feel safer? Do we understand that safety and health is something that we practice every day in our daily life. And when we go to work, it impacts on us positively. Because the thing is, when you go to work, the goal is to go back home safely to your, to your, to your loved ones. And also, through chronic exposure in the workplace, and when we're in safety and health, we always say the age is a small age. People don't pay much attention to health. But when that is not dealt with, when you retire, they can't enjoy retirement. Retired 50 at 51 Budu. And even in areas, and this is a kind of new area in terms of stress, one of my previous working, my working experiences working in the Trinity Bureau Prison Service. And there was this colleague, he retired, is he retired today? 
good 55 years, one of the you know, best guys, the best guys you would know. Had no sickness or had no to play football, cricket, was not a drinker, and boom, next day, you know, guy died. And it was a matter of <coughs> stress over time. Because the work of a prison is very stressful. And that is an area of safety that we have to start paying attention to stress in the workplace. It's a silent killer. We just don't know we are affected by it. We feel everything is on people, we don't feel it. But it eats away at us. So that's the next development is something we want to push for to get people to understand that stress is something that you may not be able to enjoy your retirement, but it eats away at you during your working life. So nice, we should the point now that we have the, the usher in place. It was an act of February 17, 2006. And that was an article through Section 98, was brought into effect on August 17, 2007. Now, what happened? We had from the period, now people were here, the operator said they had uh, 2004 mm -hmm. as amended 2006. You all have heard that in the past, right? Right, so there was a bill. The bill became an act in 2004. But with any piece of legislation, if it is not proclaimed, it remains just that has to be proclaimed by the president. So that's why you would have had the 2004 Act, <clears throat> but the amendments of 2006, that is when Parliament, they're the ones who make the laws that go on our country, they would have sit and agreed upon some amendments that was made to the 2004 piece of legislation. And that will, will be called Act Number 3 of 2006. And that's all the amendments that impacted positively on the 2004 legislation. Some may say not positively, but it impacted on it. Because why I say it impacted on it? It was at that time the whole issue of the proclamation of the other shot came into being. Through legal notice number 48 that says that under section 98, section 98 was repealed <coughs> and brought into effect the full act as of August 17, 2007. So now, from that time going forward, we now have the legislation that governs us, and presently governs us in the context of sitting in the workplace. So we are not in this alone. So we take a, if we take a look at a, a world perspective, and this is taken from an Iowa newsletter of 2008, January 2008, and this was. Uh, GDPs. Ah, so you say I can't figure trillions. You know, I was I would encourage you all to do some searching. I came across it, but I wasn't comfortable with the reference where, where I found it. But they were saying in that piece of literature, four trillion. Four trillion United States dollars. Is what 3.9% of the annual global GDP is. Four trillion. Huh? That's yes, and now, as I said, the source wasn't comfortable with the source, so I would encourage you all, because all about learning, do the research, and whenever we cross paths again, you can already get my call at the agency, I'll give you my contact. Right? 755 and tell me what it came up with, right? And if further went on to say the tool. On human, the, sorry, the toll on human life from workplace accidents and injury today is unacceptable <clears throat> and entirely avoidable. And it is imperative that we act together to make a difference. And the team of acting together, and I want this to be the thread that interwoven all of us into this session and, you know, binds us going forward. Together. Safety is something together. We in this together. It's not the employer by himself, it's not the employee by himself, it's not the union by himself, it's not the government by himself, there's nobody by himself. This don't make any song. I get a song with hands coming together. So in terms of safety, I 
And that is the team. If you go back to what the president said in his speech, it's all about we all in this together, the same thing. You can write up a minute and say the same thing, it's the same trend. It's all about we doing it together. So we just want to take a look at some statistical data. And this was taken from the article we had for um, Sunday, the commemoration of World Health and Safety Day. So with Barry and Hobbit and Fabitis Primus. And the data indicated in 2000, in 2016 to 2017, there were 15 fatalities in Trinidad and Tobago. So that's uh, financial year. But as we go to 2017, 28, what do you all think it went up or it went down? Went up. Went up? Okay. Anybody else have a, what do you all think it went up or it went down? If you already article, you have the answer, but talk to me. What do you all think it went up or it went down? Huh? People say it went up. And we see not only backdrop that, um, as we were in a, you know, in formal discussion, that people aren't really into, we don't know naturally about safety. But interestingly, it went down. For the same financial year, for the financial year 2017 to 2018, up to the 3.3% decrease. Now, that says something. It says there is a, the work that is being done. And I tell people safety is not something that they attract a lot of fan fear, but at the end of the day, the impact is felt. We may minuscule in some instances, but as long as we stick at it and we keep working at it, positive impact and the downward trends will continue to happen. We cannot leave it alone. We cannot tell ourselves it's going to take care of itself. We all have to take care of it together. Now, as long as we take care of it together, we're going to get the results at the end of the day. Okay? So, those are fatal fatal accidents where people have died. So let's look at a definition of we in the um, Russian agency and the people who participate in the world, critical injuries, right on critical accidents. So we have a start for that too. For the same period, 2016, 2017, we had 84 critical accidents with no injury. <coughs> So what do you all think? Went up or went down? Let's play, let's play it again. Chicken and eggs. So everybody said what went. So um, critical, an example of critical injury is if you would uh, break a hand, break a foot, fracture hand, fracture foot, loss a hand, loss a foot, major burn, burn, burn the major part of the body, loss of an eye, loss of consciousness, major loss of blood. All these are definitions. So you feel it went up or down? Went down? In my company, it always went down. You all went down? Yeah. So let's say, what are we doing? So there was a downward trend. It continued, small as, as it may be. Just 3.6%, but the idea is it's going down. It's not trending up. And Rome wasn't built in a day, so as we take these little snapshots and we continue to work on it gradually, the numbers will keep coming down as we all become part of the solution and continue to work together to make it happen. And in closing, I have to go back to you know, where I start, I have to end. I want you all to go and see it for that dance. That's speech by the person. She said, at the same time here in Trinidad, all national development is therefore dependent on the care and attention paid by both employers and employees employers and employees to the requirements outlined in the Occupational Safety and Health Act 2004. And I couldn't think of a better way to conclude this first session because it hammers home the point about we in this together, both employers and employees. 
they were treated with the requirements uh, as how the line in the occupation safety and health plan. If the agency accomplished one thing today, for those of you all who I know most of you have, most students are Australian students, the people who work <coughs> in the regional corporations and anybody else, and this is live stream, so we touching everybody. When we leave this, when we leave here today, the first thing you should be doing is going on your computers in the age of technology. And if you don't have a copy of the occupation as you can help that, download one from the ministry website, be it the OSH agency, be it Shop Labor, be it Legal Affairs. Because safety and health is something that we are all impacted upon now. Although you would see the issue of the employer and the employee, there's a section of the act that also speaks, section seven, subsection one, puts a duty to people to have, you're responsible for people's safety and health who are also not in your employment. So although you will see it big and broad employer for your relationship, but we want people to understand even people who are not in employment and you are an employer, you're responsible for those people when they come to the city. And we all, right now we go to groceries, to slip and fall. You all have seen newspapers where people have sued businesses after slipping and falling in places and being injured. And it goes across the board. So safety is not just about employer, employee, and the other people I spoke about. But you as an employer, must appreciate that you always meant all persons who are also not in your employment. Even as an independent contractor, you must ensure that your operation doesn't put those persons at risk. I must say, um, I will just set the table for the day two session and wrap up. So day two will be done by Sorani Archibald. It will be here Tuesday. So we're going to have the session. Um, right. And according to the numbers, the college has recently um, indicated the numbers as well. You will find ourselves in the auditorium. So we'll defer to that. So on day two, the topics, and we're going to go deeper into the whole concept of technology, digitalization and ICT, automation, robotics, the opportunities and challenges of automation and robotics, demographics, we didn't go into much of that today. I can't see Mr. Ashbal Stander. Young workers and aging worker population, because as healthcare becomes, you know, improves, you're gonna find people living longer. Gender, in the context of the workplace, all the gender issues. Have we touched a bit of it? Migrant workers, the issue of climate change, sustainable development, because with this, this encourages sustainable development and the issue of security and threats in the workplace. Now we're gonna leave something for the people who are in the labor department. With this drive of automation robotics, I could hear the labor people saying, hey, less employees, more robots. And my thing is, what we need to do even as a practitioner, you're still going to have employee and equipment interface. The risk may change, the hazards may change, but the machines can't do it by themselves. We have to build it, we have to maintain it, we have to operate it. So we're still going to have the interaction of it. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> I'd like to thank Mr. Victor Salazar for this um, wonderful presentation. Um, at this time, we want to open up the floor to the um, panel, so whatever questions you may have, um, we want to open it up to Mr. Solomon, Mr. Brisbane, and Mr. Salazar at this point in time. Oh, it's a crowded boy. Oh, boy, it's too much to <laughs> say the same time. All right. I have a question. I have a comment. I want to wrap up. It was before the presentation started. And by the way, wonderful presentation. As I, as, I, as I started by saying, when I came here, I came here as a novice. I came here with an interest to learn. And 
somebody who was hungry to live. In fact, I've learned a lot. So much so that I feel as if, like the lady in front there, I feel as if in Trinidad and Tobago, we are health and safety sponsors. We are occupational safety and health and the environment <coughs> sponsors. There's no real no here. It's all about, it's all about, are you doing it? It has money in it. That's the reality I've seen. And um, let's touch on, I attend Cyprian. As I said before, Cyprian is the umbrella organization for occupational health and safety. Not just in China today, but in the Caribbean. And as an institution, I'm saying it here, and I've said it before, and I'm hoping it, I can be heard over the audio that is being carried by. <coughs> It's sickening we are losing as an institution. If it is we are serious about the moral, legal, and financial implications that come with the responsibility in terms of being occupational health and safety practitioners, we are failing. As lecturers, we are failing. Why I say we are failing? Because we can't afford to be here in an institution knowing what is happening here as health and safety practitioners and fail to see or come see it every day and fail to address it. It means then that we are failing. And I keep saying this, how it is as a student, I, I am supposed to go out because I'm not from to be home. So I'm expected to go home in St. Vincent and Nevis. Help my government to create Ashla because we don't have any. The same tradition, just like how you guys started with the Moine Commission from 1935, after 1935 riots, and so you had the Moine Commission in 1938, 1939, it's the same thing. We had the factory ordinance, and that's the same thing we work with. So we, we have no ashram. But how can I go out there and say this and encourage my government to create ashlars and implement policy? When in the school, we are being taught, I can't, I can't encourage or help, you understand? To inspire change where it is necessary and needed. The truth it is needed right here. And I think, like I said, we are learning, we are learning a lot. Eh? And because I am learning, I'm scared. Scared in the sense that we see and yet still we are not saying what we are seeing or we are not assessing how we, what, 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 what is it, what is it, what is a double standard? Uh, it's a situation where people just do what they have to do because it's, like I say, it's about money. And I feel like there's a double standard that we need to get to moving in the right <coughs> direction. We, we, we're preaching one thing and practicing another, and it, it is sad. One thing I wanted to take away from this, there's a quote by Mark Magandhi. Be the change you want to see. So when you get back home to St. Kitts Nevis, that same passion you have, Safety and help. <clears throat> you know, let it permeate through the system there. Just read well. You also said, yeah. you also said, live every day as if it's your last. Beautiful. And educate yourself as if you're going to live forever. Yes. Yeah, Creating a, a safe working environment is essentially a it seems to be a balance between the cost of putting it right and the risks of, of not putting it right. And that essentially means it's a bargaining issue. And where there are recognized trade unions in a workplace, then it's quite clear that workers through their unions can actually argue with the employer for improved working conditions. Now, the problem that we have in Trinidad and Tobago is that more than 80% of workers in this country are not covered by union recognition agreements. Now, it doesn't mean they're not in unions. Now, my question to the panel is, in those circumstances, what role does the OSH Act give to trade unions where there is not a recognition agreement? Because it does seem to me it gives no effective role whatsoever. The most it seems that I can do is to ring up the OSH hotline and hope that you people go in. Because if you do go in and do a report, I can't even get a copy of that report and follow through. And Section 83A of the Act says it's not the union but the worker that reports it to the industrial court. So the union is chopped out completely of that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm uh, from the Labour Department. That is quite, that is quite correct. However, as Mr. Salazar had just mentioned, the onus is on union employees. You have a right under the law, just like your employee 
employers have a right under the law. And for you to, 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 to make a statement that the unions, unions have a role to play, and they play that role well. I will give them that. They play that role well. But I often say to, to individuals out there, person that we interact with, if you are in a sport and you don't understand the rules of that sport, you're operating at a disadvantage. We say in, in, in the general public, if you don't have a ticket, you can't win the lotto. Mr. Salazar started off by asking how many of you may have actually read the usher to actually have a copy of the act. If you don't understand the legislation that you're operating and working by, you're going to be at a disadvantage every single time. No, where there is the absence of a majority bargaining unit where the union can operate, that is where the act talks about having a safety and health committee. That is their role and function. Before you even come to the act, to the agency, the the company, the employees must take it to the employer so that they can act. It's only when that process breaks down, the agency gets involved. No, there is a, sometimes there is a disconnect. We understand that. But we know, can only, if the, the, how, the, how the system is set up, you're forcing the agency <coughs> to be reactive. Whereas you will have to play a more vital role in bringing those situations to your employers and forcing them by understanding your rights under the law. Once you are able to do that, it will now force the unions to step into the position to aid you all rather than be against you all in most of some of these circumstances that we have faced. I don't know if that answers your question. For well, me, it doesn't. Uh, no, no, no. The employment relationship is essentially unequal, right? And, just, and I think it's I think it's naive to say that individual uneducated, uneducated in the sense of uneducated in terms of labor legislation and OSH legislation to actually take on their employer. Right? When you say unions should pick up on it, yeah, unions will pick up on it when the workers get dismissed for trying to take some action. Um, the, the legislation is weak, so what my challenge really is, what, how can the legislation be improved and how can unions, where they're not recognized but have members and have got issues they want to raise, how can the legislation help unions in those circumstances? Well, in the app, <coughs> oh, section 5 of the app speaks to <coughs> the use of a collective bargaining document as an instrument to manage safety and health. You go to section 5, subsection 4, and it just says at the end of the day, a collective agreement is anything that is superior to the OSHA is something that could govern and manage safety. So the baseline is the, the baseline is the OSHA. But if you have something superior in your collective agreement, that affords a level of protection to the employees on one end. Now, when we have the issue of refusal to work. Under section 16, not only the unions, union employees are involved in the process. We have something they call employee representatives. Because in some organizations, they aren't, they aren't unions, as you quite clearly said. So the act has there, and in that section of the act, it speaks to the recognition of an employee representative where no union exists. Now, I agree with you, obviously, the act. Over time, as we use it, it's a living document. Legislation all over the world will have to be amended as you use it. But there are, in, there are, there are instances where it could be used, as I just pointed out there, where there's a, a section that caters for an environment where there's no employee representative in the context of a union, where you can have that interaction. And, in, and on the safety committees, Employee representative the same way. But you may have a you, you may have a organization that don't have a union, but they have a safety committee. The same thing applies there. And the nice thing about a safety committee under section 25 E and F of the Usher, with respect to its function, it tells us where something cannot be resolved by the safety committee, it could be reported to the chief inspector. And as Francois was saying, that is when we get it. But the act as a working document, it seeks to encourage 
the issues being addressed by the users of it. So the employers, the employees. It's about those parties using the act to ensure safe workplaces exist. A continuation of it. The agency as France, as I mentioned, been as indicated. We ought to come in when or when that fails. Same with the free to work. After the safety committee had, has addressed the issue and there's an aggrieved party still, then it is reported to the OSH agency. But what we tell employers, what we tell employees when they come to refuse to work, first thing we ask, did you go through your safety committee? Long one exists. Because that is important. And if you haven't, we send you right back there because that is a tool, an instructive tool in the legislation that encourages the parties to address the problem and find the remedy <coughs> before the agency becomes involved. But I understand that it's not a popular legislation. In fact, the Russian agency has some consultation going on for this week and going forward. Where we're going to be looking at, you know, pushing to the forefront regulations, and we have had consultations on amendments to the Act. So we recognize that any position needs strengthening, and that is being addressed as we go forward into the future. Yes. Okay, Mr. Salazar, you, you talk about um, <clears throat> looking at the collective agreement. But if you don't have a recognized majority union in a workplace, there's no collective agreement. And Point therefore, it, it, it actually limits the workers themselves. And I know their places. Um, having been a trade unionist for 27 years, actually be before that really as a short story, but 27 years working full time in a union, I recognize the challenge that is there out there. Unless the law says so, that you have that right to go in there and do that, it bars you. And right now trade unions are going to a problem of trying to represent workers who cannot get it through the courts via <laughs> their, their safety committees and what have you, the problems that they may be having. And therefore, when the trade unions go in to, to, to try to represent them, they are told they have to get a letter from sanctioning that from the worker, the aggrieved worker themselves. And plenty of times you have a short fall in that because the workers themselves don't have a clue as to how to articulate their own matter. And so you have serious problems with that. That is something that needs to be looked at seriously and be amended. Because if there are no collective agreement, the collective thought, um, Bargaining process would not achieve that. It certainly would not. Okay. I just want to, there's a kind of imbalance in this session. <coughs> <laughs> 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 just somebody had their hands up there at the back. Oh. Uh, just before Mr. Mills, um, uh, just, just to add to what um, Ms. Davis was saying, um, Tutor Grand <coughs> Vega Unified Teachers Association is the recognized union for teachers, right? Now, under, under the ECC, which is the early childhood care, those teachers are not under Tutor, right? They are under some some other union, I believe, is with the ambulance workers. <clears throat> so, of course, they are not recognized as a as a major as a major union for them. So, in their cases, it goes back to what Ms. Davis is saying. They cannot approach the Ministry of Education with regards to any health and safety concerns. They cannot even approach them because they are not part of Tutor as a union. Because they, they do not fall under. You understand? So <clears throat> it falls in line with what she's saying. They don't have a record. They have someone that they are under as a union. But that union, when they go, when they go to the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Education shuts them down, saying that they are not recognized. But the first agency, as Mr. Virginia indicated, we have a hotline up. I think it came from the floor. Okay. Uh, we have a, a hotline up, right? That Anybody, any employee, now we are targeting and focus on the union the interaction. As, as, as yeah. I know, interaction with, right. with, with those teachers, and they are now recognizing their mistake of joining the ambulance union when they should have joined the tutor. But that has, that has, 
whatever union you are affiliated with has nothing to do with your civil right under safety and health legislation in general. I understand, and I'm glad you brought that up. And has nothing to do with it. So if it is, because when, when Mr. Salazar was speaking to, was alluding to the point of refusal to work, it does not speak to whether or not you are affiliated with a union. It's you, mm -hmm. the individual. Mm -hmm. So whether or not you are rec you are being supported by a recognized union and your employers, which you have a duty under law, under Section 10 as an employee, one of your fundamental duty is to inform your employer where they are in breach. <laughs> no. If it is that you have an issue at work, no. You see, one of the things that we have, a, we, we, we recognize when we go out there, people have a disconnect between what is health and safety and IR issues. That is something that has been going on for years. People strike in Trinidad and Tobago claiming health and safety issues. But when you listen, there's one issue that may be health and safety, and all the rest is dealing with salary negotiations and whatnot. That has been employed for many years. However, when it comes to safety and health, you must have an understanding what the law says and what your right is. Once you understand that, you have a right to approach your employer and inform them where they are in breach. What does that mean, where they are in breach? If there is an issue that has the potential to infringe on your safety, health, and well-being, you are to bring it to their attention to be addressed. How do you do that? You do that via your safety and health committee. It didn't say the union, it said the safety and health committee. <clears throat> no. In the absence of a safety and health committee, then you can go to your worker representative, which may be a union rep, or somebody in the organization that you recognize may be more articulate, more outspoken, and can bring their issues to the forefront. Then so be it. You also supposed to bring it to your supervisor, your media supervisor, who represents the employer. Because they need to know what your issues are. But sometimes we are afraid. That is why the act makes protection for you who want to step up. If it is you are dismissed for bringing up a safety and health issue, the act makes provision for that. So whether there's a union involved or not has nothing to do with the issue with health and safety. Once we follow the, the, the parameters <coughs> that is outlined in the act, you will be okay. Now, once you have brought that to the attention of your employers and you believe sufficient time has elapsed and you have recognized no feedback is forthcoming, whether that verbal written or anyhow, then you bring that evidence that you have brought it to your employers to the agency then we will intervene on your behalf. So it doesn't matter with the union. The union can intervene if there's a, a, a bargaining unit, as we say, yes. But in the absence of it, you as an individual have that right. Now, remember, under unions, we will have, like, for instance, we have our grievance procedure. Yes. Good. So we will have a protocol by which to follow in terms of um, letting our employers know, the employer know. Um, what our grievance is, right? So I can give you a classic example. In 2015, the school that I am I am employed at, I'm in Port of Spain, we did not have, at that time, an OSH committee, right? We now do, just about a year and something ago. At that time, we had a serious problem with pigeon infestation within the roofs of the building. And the building is a pretty old building. So, as being the only technical person amongst the teachers, I told them that we will need to get a health inspector to come in to assess the severity of the problem. And then from there, that report can be taken to the Ministry of Education through the different, the different levels of authority, right? That was done. Almost a year passed. And the Ministry of Education never sent anyone to come and investigate. So I took it upon myself to call someone from the Wash Agency to take a, take a visit and 
give me your view, maybe I'll report. That was um, uh, Mr. Charles. Right? Definitely, they got action. Right. Beautiful, so we will get. So, he did come in. I must say, was very, very <coughs> eloquent in terms of his explanation. I learned a lot. In fact, I learned of one of these zoonoses that we are living right now, cytosis, which is a terrible, terrible disease. Right? <coughs> the report was done. I had called Mr. Charles thereafter. He had done the report. And of course, you all will have your protocols by which you would send the report. So, said that the report was sent to the school supervisor, three of the Cornerstone District, and to the permanent set in the Ministry of Education. That went there. So, I asked him if it is that I, as a representative for my school, because I'm the staff rep for my school, or one of the staff reps, if I can get access to that report told me that I will have to liaise with my employers to be able to get that. I asked my principal, we are in 2019, <coughs> not school anymore, for the next two years, I have not yet seen that report. And that's a recognized union. You tried that, it is no recognized union. You won't get a thing, you know. So I give you a, a, a very classic example. Not that the OSH has failed. Is that our it's employer not has failed in not recognizing the power that you all have in terms of assessing the severity and then taking an action to rectify? So, what we're looking forward for what I told your colleague from St. Kitts, and you get back there after your studies here. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be there and make it happen. Beautiful. I want to make it happen. If I may interject, um, the other legislation that we can use as well, we have the OSHAR, and I do quite right, we have under, run, run and run from the OSHAR agency as well. Yeah. Sorry. We have procedures to follow in terms of who we send the report to. So if you have a, if you, if your employer refuses <coughs> to give you the report, you have under the Freedom of Information Act, you can submit a Freedom of Information request to the OSHAR agency, and I only said that because I understand that the Ministry of Education is one of the ancient dinosaurs from way back. So, you know, you have to give them time for it to soak in and then respond. But, like I said, since 2015 to 2019, I think I have given them more than enough time. <laughs> but, uh, but how much, how, much, how much of you all um, <coughs> heard the GSC? There's a GSC committee meeting with the OSHA agency attended some for some time last year. Many of you all <coughs> listened to it or viewed it. And it highlighted generally all ministries have challenges. And the OSHA agency is on a drive right now to, through guidance of the board, to actually interact with ministries to work with them to become much compliant. So the goal is really to treat with those issues you're having, where we're going to actually interact with the ministries, see the challenges they have, and you know, get them to a point that they are more compliant with the legislation. It's something that spreads right of course, but it takes a little while, and that GCC um, committee session really opened our eyes to the challenges faced as collectively as a, as a country going forward. So everybody's on board now and trying to make it happen. But I just want to reiterate, you know, at the end of the day, the general public look at the Gosh agency as the enforcement agency. Yes, we are. <coughs> so you can keep that in the back of your mind. However, our focus and drive really and truly is to aid you all as much as we can with our limited resources, and we also have to remember we are only can we can only expand as far as the act carries us. We cannot go outside of that parameter. So at the end of the day, even after that, JSC, it, it, it was clear to note that we have some challenges internally, but we respond. So you can be rest assured that. 
whatever complaint that you have, whatever issue that you have in the workplace, whether you are unionized <clears> or not, once you have followed the process, you can come to us. We will interact on your behalf. That is our guarantee. Is your hotline 623 OSHA? Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 I've been through that one to one. I've done law once, twice, and I have a third session to do. And the truth is, at the end of it all, I still do not understand most of what is being stated in the act. And so that's a challenge that the OSHA organization has moving forward. They need to help to change the wording, make it more simplified for the people who it really <coughs> matters to. Because the people who don't really matter to, which is the minority, they know what it says. But yet still, they do not implement what it says. And when the government implemented what it wants says, they still use tricks and tactics from the same act. You understand? Like, as so far, reasonable <coughs> practical. And so, me, I'm an employer. I employ 20 persons. And because I employ 20 persons, I actually ask up the door. You see, that's how you look at it. But remember, as so far reasonable, practical, it comes down to risk equals severity times probability. My situation is I have 20 people working for me. The probability of this accident or incident occurring is less than the person of this amount of people. So I'm saying there are means and ways that employers are currently utilizing the same act that is put there to protect me. The people, the majority, against us. And so I have here that too much of bureaucracy, too much of red tape, eliminate the hurdles that the poor <coughs> people for the act is put here to protect and understand have to go through. I don't know how you guys can to do it, but I'm glad I'm here. I'm here in white point in time too. Because like I say, safety don't have nothing like this. And it is my duty to make sure that whenever they can to introduce something as this. It is done in a way that the majority, you understand, who the, law, who the laws are being put in place to protect, they could understand and relate to it. The follow it shouldn't be so difficult, yeah, to, 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 to move a situation from one point to the next. Let's be real. 47 years? 33 years? Well, well, 47 now. Come on, from 1972 to now, it's 47, so we're counting everything. <laughs> But about everything. So it's clear years something was on the books. So it means all the time you know that it was coming with this law. 14 years it has been established. And 14 years <coughs> later, the act is still in the same essence that it came to us back then. It means, and I'm saying this just like how I started, it means that you guys are failing us. And I'm not afraid <coughs> to say, where are you guys are failing? Let us be real. After 15 years of having an ASCA, you guys can't see the ambiguity there. You can't, you guys know, you guys don't realize that there the, the are ways for employers to you understand what to make and get. Okay, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do this, and this is what we're going to do, and this is what we're going to make sure that the employees are not protected because they do a lot of things. And they, I'm just here for a short time, but I've seen, I've heard, I've read, I've heard a lot of situations that is happening on the ground. And, and and I think that there's much more to be done, you understand, from a trade and a vehicle perspective. The truth is, um, we are us, we are us is concerned, you guys, um, we have a lot of people who study the subject, but to say they go and practice it, implement it, and to make sure that the person who they are working with understand what they know, that is not being done. And so you guys, at the OSHA agency, you guys have a I I I think a role to play in terms of educating the people and helping us, the people, to understand everything that we need to know 
about the us agency, the act itself, and how we can utilize it to protect ourselves, you understand, in terms of situation when they do arrive. Okay. Now, your agency, let's go on. Yeah. Okay, I'll hold it down. You know, somebody will say there with your one. The agency has a sensitization drive. Employers or unions could write to the executive director requesting to have sensitization sessions done on any topic they do. And it is done at no cost to the employer <coughs> or to the union. And it's something we put out there to do the same thing as you indicated, to allow the dissemination of the information that, as you said, may seem so scriptive or um, documented as the act is, it may seem so scripted that you don't understand, you don't want to understand. Our job is to continue the sensitization drive. As long as people make that request, the agency with its limited resources, as Mr. Brisbane indicated, we go out there and treat with the request of the employers, the unions, the men you have requested. Because as you rightfully said, the information should not only reside in the book. And that's one thing I, I, I told you all when I finished my presentation. I want you all to go and get your hand on a copy of the Asha. Yes, you're reading it. <clears throat> but constant tooling and interacting with it, because as you rightfully said, the interaction with the legislation allows you to fully understand. But you made a point that some employers would put the abandonment of 20 employees and prevent them from being compliant with the OSHA. There are some sections of the Act that <coughs> speaks to having a bandwidth of employees of 25 persons have a policy. But let's look at the issue of risk assessment. There isn't a bandwidth on that. You have to do a risk assessment for all employees. The only bandwidth it says that for less than 20 employees, it must be it must, it is ordinary to be documented, but you must demonstrate that you will have did a risk assessment and communicate information to the employees. So even in the, so the employer cannot renege on dealing with risk assessment issues and ensuring safe places of work exist by doing hazard analysis, doing risk assessment, and ensuring people are working in safe workplaces because they don't have 20 employees or 25, whichever the bandwidth is, you want to put it at. So there are sections of the act that covers that. The chief inspector has the power, based on the same thing as you indicated, the level of risk. The chief inspector can dictate to an employer, but <coughs> less than 25 employees, have a safety policy. Mm -hmm. So the bandwidth exists, yes, but there are ways, as long as you rightfully said, the risk is high, the station put something in place where the chief inspector can make that call and legally force the employer to persist something in place to create health and safety workplaces. No. Also, to answer your question, <clears throat> to further reiterate, then if it is that you're an employer and you're saying that you don't understand, so far as is reasonably practicable and some of these other terminologies in there, when we go to court, do we go and stand up before a magistrate and understand those laws and rules? And, no, we hire a lawyer who understands that terminology. Yes? That is why, again, under the OSHA Act again, it says that once you have more than 25 employed persons, you are, as an employer, is to hire a safety and health practitioner to advise you on what the Act states and what is your role and function and what is your responsibility on that law. You cannot expect the OSHA agency and even if we were up to full capacity and had a hundred inspectors it is almost impossible to deal with close to what was the last estimate we had of in registered industrial establishments in China and to be right it's over hundred some thousand registered business I mean, even when you look at a classroom, even the classroom setting has a parameter of how many students one lecturer could, should be able to mandate. 
No, we are asking all these businesses for the, the, the limited amount of, of persons. <clears throat> now, there is an ILO calculation, I believe, is for, uh, I think it's for 120,000 workmen. It's supposed to have one safety inspector or something, so per capita, something to, something to that effect or something like that. I mean, at the end of the day, employers, that is why our act in itself is self-regulated. It puts the onus on you, the employer. You are in a business. You are there to make a profit, not so. So if it is you are in business to make money, then you have to protect your assets. Your, one of your greatest assets is not your machinery, but your personnel. And you now have to put things in place to protect them. And if it is, and it's something I often tell persons, when you're dealing with individuals such as these, ignorance of the law is not an excuse. No, at the end of the day, if it is that you are going to be engaging in a business, you ought to know what are the risks are. That is why these businessmen, where they take a lot of risks. And they now have to pay for those risks. However, they also have to calculate and inject funds to deal with those risks. I mean, at the end of the day, you can't expect any agency or anybody to do so. That's why it's self-regulated. You have to understand the nature of your business, what it will require for you to maintain a certain level of safety to operate your business because, as we say, safety is one of the few things that don't generate money. <clears throat> However, it can preserve your longevity in a business and bring in business because of your safety record. Yeah? So, it's, it's kind of harsh to put it out of the agency that we are failing. I mean, if you look at the statistics in itself, a decrease in fatal accidents by 33.3% for the limited number of staff we have had, an increased number of reporting of accidents that we have had. I mean, we don't publicize it as we ought to, but we do work. The gentleman there recognize he can make a phone call and be react. We may not give you the response that you want because we may not have the necessary resources, but we put everything that we have to serve you all every day. Every single day. Um, going along with what you're, with what you're speaking about, um, I think that's a little bit of a few years, straight out of you. Um, did recognize that they're going to be bouncing up a lot of contractors, right, who are businessmen, right, may not have um, that experience in terms of construction, but they have the money to be able to <coughs> start a business, quote unquote, right, because of their lack of understanding of safety, and they are not registered. I have had the pleasure and displeasure of meeting a lot of these contractors who do not understand safety, not registered, so they are unaware of the potential risks that they are putting their workers under, right? Ms. Davis alluded to, in one of our classes with her, that her son had made mention of an unsafe act that his employer was asking him to do. And when he indicated what he asked him to do is unsafe, they told him to go home. Now, maybe that con maybe that contractor or that employer may not be registered, you know, in that the, the young man could have been able to make it an issue. So what what can the OSH agency do to assist workers who may not have that level of understanding in terms of safety and are working in environments where these employers are not registered and also very ignorant about the fact of safety in the workplace and how, how important it is 
even for creating a profit. Because if you take care of the safety issues, then you will not have anyone being damaged, loss of time, etc., etc., etc. And we'll have learned all of that. If they don't understand that, you're going to continue having these minor accidents and stuff like that. So what I was going to ask, and then you, you had said, you're limiting resources in terms of manpower. So I was going to ask if you all have a specific unit within the agency that, you know, visit random businesses. Doesn't matter. You see a construction site taking um, construction going on, you take a walk in because you have that right as an inspector walking. And if you see an unsafe app, you can ask for the employer or the manager or whoever and inform them of that. We all have that unit within. You don't have a unit. You don't have a unit, but it's amazing that you'll make such a statement. Um, we at the agency have been on a drive <clears> to <throat> generate statistics because we recognize our manpower is limited. So we cannot target and just go and pelt all over the place. Right. So we have waited a few years, built some statistics to generate where our accident frequencies in the country <clears throat> is on the rise. And we are now targeting those organizations. Now, over the years, because of the construction boom, construction may have been the highest culprit with regards to accidents. I believe the statistics lately have shown that the manufacturing has taken, has taken <coughs> the, 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 the champion trophy. So that day in, in itself is how we are going to address these issues. Now, again, via the hotline, telephone calls, we have now set up a system internally that it, where we can prioritize these complaints. So like, for instance, if it is a passing by construction site and you see unsafe practices, call into the hotline. An inspector will make an evaluation. The supervisor will then be contacted and say, hey, we have a Mr. So-and-so in, in that area. Hey, go check out that company one time. We have put things in place to deal with that. Yeah? So as I said, 6 to 3 OSHA, write it down. That's our hotline that Mr. Yeah. Ms. Bailey said within two. Well, and it is 24 hours. And it's, yeah, 6 to 3 OSHA. So don't take it for granted. It is 24 hours, so please don't be prank calls. <laughs> we do respond. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we do respond. Yeah. Even at 2 o'clock in the morning, we do respond. Good day, good day. Uh, there are so many things going around that I got lost. For instance, we started off by my good friend Sarah also saying to me, or Terry saying to you, that room wasn't built in a day. Once I said that to my father, and he said it's because he was in the coma. <laughs> so we have these kinds of things going on all uh, There was a good gentleman saying there about the pigeon and that it's the right to refuse work. And the statement, somewhere in that statement, they are talking about serious and imminent danger. And the word imminent brings time into focus. I don't know where he sees time. Because if it's been there for a long time, it's not imminent. So it's, so in other words, some of these things that we are taking on the right to refuse may not be there. It might be just be under health. You know, so you, we have to be careful about this. I am talking about this because I thought I would have taken some time to tell you about myself. My good friend talked about 1973. I joined the Ministry of Labor in 1973 as a factory inspector. So that's what they are talking about, is what we had done several times. Okay. <laughs> you know? So let's start with 1973. Maybe I should tell you before that. Because we haven't got much time. But I got into safety in when I say like in London, I in 68, I got my first degree in mathematics. I'm really a mathematician. And I got a job in telecommunication in England 
to work with engineers. And I was sent on a three months course in safety to work with engineers. But then my wife in about 1970 said, ah, but I want to go home. You know, you know how women have control everything. And in 71, I came back to China. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah. So I came back to China. But I was looking for a job, you know, as a, you know, say, do you think they're like an engineer or anything? No. The only thing I get to teach was Naprima girls, 11 months. So I ended up teaching Naprima girls, 11 months. Until there was a game on cricket at the Oval, and I met a friend, his name was Ruba King. And I said to him, well, how, is, how is John D? Because he was supposed to be working in John D. He had his higher national diploma in mechanical engineering. I said, how is John D? I am John D. I am a safety officer in the Ministry of Labor. I said, what well, safety officer? He said, yes. I said, no, I do three months safety. He said, you do three months? He said, me and do any, you know? <laughs> I said, well, how are you going to work? I said, but you will you come back to the water. You know? He said, apply. I said, well, when I see it in the, the newspaper, he said, you come back to I tell you, apply it in both newspaper. So I did apply. And I got the job. And I went to work in the Ministry of Labor, factory inspector. There were just, there were three of them before me. And then we, they took on three people. I was number six. And we were supposed to do the whole of Trinidad to be six persons. I think I used to live south. And so the other five, they were living in the north. So I got the nice area <coughs> from Point Lisa's to Icacas, to Guaya Guaya. That was my area. And so I enjoyed it. And there are many things that he was talking about that as a safety person, we were going out there doing everything. There are the good times, bad times, in the sense that some of the things you're asking about, you drive along, you see a place, you're finding something wrong, you're driving, a guy, one the guy you knew once said me, I said, have you got, you know, have you, did you fill out the form to register? He said, may I fill it out that? He said, you make me fill out that again, but that's scotch. I ain't filling out that. <laughs> what is, you know, when they all talk, we sat down and we chat. And then he said, well, you think I should fill out that? I say, so what? He said, I <laughs> You know, this is what it's all about. I'm saying all of this because I think that safety and health, they've come a long way. But as I say, I, my background is maths. I like to, and so, I, as I said to him, I started off doing the DC things. Like I'm saying, what is a hazard? And then I say, hazard is the probability of an accident is greater than zero. <laughs> You see risk? What is risk? Because today, probability of an accident times the cost of the accident. Right? So what do you notice about that? You are saying that if there is, suppose there is no risk, there is no hazard. That is correct. Because if there is no, if the, the, the probability of the accident here yeah, is zero. Or you, in other words, you put the other way around. If you put the probability of an accident is equal to zero, you will find them dead or to know. No hazard, no risk. And those are the simple things that as an case. Another thing we talk about, you know that one? Incident, accident. All accidents are incidents, but not all incidents are accidents. But as we are almost finished, because I say everybody wants to go, I will leave you with this one, because this is the big union one. <laughs> and productivity is equal to what? It's a function of production, quality, 
cost and loss. And that's the one that you are talking about, and that's the union. Here it is production, goods and services. It's a function of that. The quality of whatever you're doing. But I want you to bear in mind in all of these things, time is involved. Cost, oh, that's with the union, down time. You stop over any time. The supervisor in charge of that. And then the last one, at least, is the safety. Because after all of these, I left out a nice word, control. So it's a function of production, of uh, quality, of cost, loss, control. <coughs> and this is called <coughs> total loss control. When we started safety years ago, we talked only about loss control. Now we're talking about total loss control. Everything. And so therefore, you would find this productivity, which you want all short chain and to be time. We waste a lot of time, we don't time, we don't look the tools, we do all kinds of things. And that's why we say now we have reached in safety, where we are looking at the whole thing. And we're talking about the Lords. Some of you talk about hey boy. The simple thing is, return to work. And when you, I saw something, when you reach back, they give you, they say, light duty. The doctor give you one. Light duty. But you're not taking light money, but you want light duty. And what happens? Company suffer. If you, the doctor should be giving you a medical, saying either you're fit for work or you're not fit for work. You're the safety people, you are who in charge. When if something should happen to that person or afterwards, what would you say? What would you do? They'll say relapse. You can't could hardly follow that phone. So my thing to you is that a safety as a matter of fact in the law, they talk about the safety practitioner, but they did not explain what level, what kind of person is a safety practitioner. They mentioned medical practitioner and they explained but not the safety practitioner. And I think that is one of the reasons that you are going to have problems. I believe, in, as these the OSHA people here, that you should put some definition. You would find that you would get practitioners who know the job, who can help, and so you, you'll be better off than just having about somebody say, I'm a safety officer. I have to do no, no quickly because every you know everything was so long. There were nine things I wanted to say about myself and how I get this, as I say, get into safety and then. But it is a beautiful subject. It's a beautiful thing. Since I've been a safety officer, I some of you might know it that when I came back and I got into I work everywhere. I work at this cut, I work at Carib, I work at sawmills. You don't want to say, follow the sun, I follow the mother. <laughs> you know, but it is the job, and it's a very good, you know, it's very interesting. And I do hope that some of you will follow it. We need, the time is coming, as these guys will tell you, they're hiring more safety officers, safety practitioners. And my good friend is saying, <clears throat> uh, in the Europe, you do not become a safety practitioner if you are not an engineer. I was sent away by the Trinidad Ministry of Labor to do my master's in industrial systems engineering, specializing in safety. That is what, that is why sometimes I'm here. I'm just trying to give back because the Trinidad government sent me to do that course. I was from the Ministry of Labor. Right? So that I'm always grateful and thankful to them. I do hope that some of you, students especially, that they will pursue what they're doing. And I think, throw everything together so as to see if you understand. It's such a short time. I know some of you want to go home. My wife tell me if I'm not a bad so. <laughs> 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 so six of you. All right, thank you. Thank you.
say, um, so I just want to take this opportunity to thank you all, students of Cypriani Labor College, uh, visitors, guests, uh, the panel, Mr. Solomon, Mr. Brisbane, and Mr. Salazar, for um, a wonderful, uh, informative <coughs> session that we have had this afternoon. Would you agree? Yes. yes. Excellent. So that means you're coming back on Thursday, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, right across there in room 108 to 109. On Thursday from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., it will be right there. And I'm um, inviting um, you guys also out there from the tertiary level uh, institution, pursuing health and safety and other fields like him, you're know, welcome to come along. Um, so at this point in time, just want to say um, get home safe, uh, enjoy the rest of the afternoon, and um, see you guys out there on Thursday. Thank you very much, the panel, and thank you very much to the audience. And so some of my
No, I mean like this evening. Yeah, yeah he's good. Yeah. He's Three upstairs.
Going across the road, Mama. What's going on?
This fella, this OJT, Sanjay.
Like if the, 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 the whole thing in our hood. Yes. Look at the army and and country and them mm-hmm. fighting a war between the two. Now, what do you say? Mm-hmm. And people say the country is pushing the head. Of course. And we Thank you. 